Hi folks, today we're going to talk about stepper motors. Previously we've talked about position and velocity sensors. We may or may not uh, have already talked about DC motors as a velocity actuator. And so we're going to talk about stepper motors today as a position actuator. First thing, we're going to talk about stepper motor designs, and then I'll cut it off and we'll do a, a separate video about stepper motor operation. So first of all, how does a stepper motor work? Well, you are going to provide to the stepper motor, or to the stepper motor driver, uh, digital pulses, and the, that digital pulse is going to trigger a rotation through a small increment, and that is what we're going to call a step. So for as many pulses as you send it, you're going to get that many steps, which means that you know exactly how far you've rotated. So that's a nice thing because unlike a, a DC motor, we don't need a sensor in order to figure out where we are. We have position control without any sort of feedback. It's an open loop control sort of setup, which that's why I think of it as a position actuator compared to a DC motor that as you apply a voltage, an analog voltage, you get a different velocity and so it's more of a velocity actuator in my mind. So stepper motors are relatively simple in construction, low maintenance, um, but each of these steps you're going to see that it's going to oscillate and then settle. So we do a step and we settle, we step and we settle. And so you don't want to go too fast or you'll start exciting the system at that resonance frequency in which case you're not going to get good behavior. behavior. So we also are going to have a heat problem because you're pumping current through this and when you're sitting there stationary you're still pumping current through this and with the fact that the windings are resistive you will have a heat problem eventually. And it is a little bit slower than a servo system. There's three different styles. There's a permanent magnet and a variable reluctance. So the permanent magnet is what you think it is. The rotor is going to be a permanent magnet and the stator is going to be electromagnet. Versus the variable reluctance, the stator is still an electromagnet, but now the rotor is ferromagnetic. So this chunk of iron is going to rotate and it's going to minimize the reluctance, which is the um, magnetic equivalent of resistance. Uh, and then in a hybrid design, you have that electromagnet stator, same as before, but now you have a rotor that is ferromagnetic and has also permanent magnet pieces on it. So we kind of combine the, the two, the variable reluctance and the permanent magnet together to get our hybrid design. So we'll talk about each one of these. First, the permanent magnet. So on the right you can see I've got the stator, that's the outer ring there, and it's got four um, permanent, or not permanent magnets, sorry, that's on the inside. So around the, the stator we've got these four sets of coils, um, and those are going to be my electromagnets. And then in the middle I've got the permanent magnet, and that's the rotor. You can see that I've got one point that's labeled just so we can see how it rotates. Um, and so what you're going to see here is that when I energize the coils, uh, the energized coils are going to um, then have a, a misalignment associated with the with the uh, rotor. So that north pole on the is on the rotor is going to want to attract to the south pole from the electromagnet. And so by changing which ones are north and which ones are south on the electromagnet, I can cause this misalignment, and that misalignment then is going to generate a torque, and then the rotor is going to rotate. So as I switch these these different uh, coils um, on or off or directionality, uh, depending on how I'm doing it, I will cause the rotor to rotate. Now even if I don't energize the coils, there's still going to be the permanent magnet effect. Uh, so the, the permanent magnet is going to generate what we call a detent torque that's going to hold it in position. That's not huge, but it, it is going to hold it in position a little bit uh, in the absence of any sort of field being applied. So what's it look like when you actually build it? Well, you're going to have a lot of, of different um, poles in there. So on the top we see a cutaway. Uh, on the bottom we see just sort of an um, unwrapping of what it looks like. So we've got the, the stator cup. Um, in this case we might have a stator top and bottom, uh, A and B. And then we've got the rotor in there. So we've got all the coils. We've got the, the rotor has many different permanent magnet uh, poles in there, and we may have these slightly offset so that we have just a bunch of different positions that we can we can set these to. And you can see that the the um, stator cups are going to be uh, 
each cup A and B is going to be wired together so that we've got um, a bunch of different uh, a bunch of different windings in there, but they're all going to be going in the in the same order. So let's look through the step sequence. So if we start at the upper left, you can see that I've got two of my electromagnets are south, the upper right um, two are going to be north, and so the oh here's my pen here we go. So these two are paired up nicely. And then these two, you can see that the, the orange point is going to be equidistant between the two, kind of minimizing that. And so the very first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with that horizontal winding, and I'm going to uh, reverse it, but I'm going to start by turning it off. So as I s turn it off, you can see that, that it's blanked out there. And then in the bottom right, you see I've reversed that. But now, now I've got this pair of north and north uh, and those two are going to try to repel each other and this north and south and this north and south are going to try to get nice and close and so that's going to enforce a rotation and which that's what you see in the new equi equilibrium in the bottom left and so that's basically the sequence I'm just going to keep stepping through that I'm going to turn off a coil I'm going to reverse the, the current through that coil so that I reverse the polarity of it and I'm going to let it settle in that new equilibrium and then I'll switch to the other coil or in the case of the the true one that I showed you, you're going to have a bunch of coils in there. Now they all may be wound the same way, so that I've just got um, two sets, uh, or they they could be a bunch of individual ones depending on what you're doing. So there's my animation, exactly what we were just talking about. I reverse one, and then I wait for it to reach a new equilibrium. So here it is again, a little larger. I start with um, my horizontal pair and my vertical pair of electromagnets all set up. There's my reference line. I reverse the horizontal pair. It rotates to this new equilibrium, and you can see that that rotation angle is one step. I can do the same thing. I can reverse the top and bottom, and I rotate through to a new equilibrium, and again, this is one step. Now, those don't look perfectly equal steps, but they should be pretty equal steps. Uh, so your m different motors are going to be specified in terms of a step size, and that's your permanent magnet style. Another option is we could have a variable reluctance. Um, in the case of the variable reluctance, like I said, the permanent magnet, permanent magnet rotor goes away and we replace it with a ferromagnetic. And so the, the ferromagnetic, we're trying to minimize the, the reluctance at any given point. Um, so it's the same sort of idea. We're going to um, change the, the coils. And as we change the coils, the rotor will rotate in order to minimize that reluctance. So this is going to give us a different step size. Um, we do not have that detent torque because we don't have a permanent magnet. It's going to be free to rotate if the coils are deactivated. Um, and we're dealing with a lower load inertia here. So here's an example of a physical construction. You can see I've got that ferromagnetic core. You can see it's got a lot of teeth in this case. And I've got um, my windings there, a couple different sets of windings. And so let's step through these. Again, I've used the, um, the circles just to indicate a, a mark of what's going on here. And I've got the, the triangle so that we track the, the rotation angle. So we'll start in the upper left. I will energize, and then I'll energize the next one. And then I will energize, um, sorry, start in the upper left, I've energized one, then I energize two, and then in the bottom right, you can see that it's rotating to minimize that reluctance. And then I can go back to energizing three, uh, and we'll rotate again. But notice that in this case, in the first one, uh, the horizontal part of the rotor is the, the part that's lined up. After I energize number two, then it's the uh, what was the vertical part of the rotor. And then we go back to the horizontal. So you can see we're, we're stepping through um, slightly different uh, steps than in the triangular um, case that I had for the permanent magnet. So here we go. My initial position here, I've energized one. 
I energize 2 and I rotate. I energize 3 and I rotate. And I can energize 1 and I rotate again. And now I've rotated through 90 degrees. So these are relatively large steps. Obviously, you'd be dealing with um, a real configuration has all that all those different teeth, lots more teeth than the four that I've shown, so you can get a much smaller step size. And that's kind of useful to get the smaller step size. Now, that's all well and good, but the better option is if I combine the the uh, permanent magnet with the, the ferromagnetic core, which is going to give me what we call a hybrid stepper motor. So in this case, I've got that ferromagnetic core, but I've got these chunks of of uh, permanent magnet around the outside of it and so now I've got higher accuracy and higher torque It does cost more because we're talking about more construction but the same sort of thing as I energize different sets of coils and I reverse the the direction of them then I get both the um, both the permanent magnet action and the variable reluctance action so here I've energized uh, the top and bottom coil together and I'm all lined up I energize the right coils and I rotate, or sorry, right and left coils. I reverse the top and bottom and I rotate. Oops, I guess I thought I had one more in there. And we can just keep going through this sequence. So we have to have this this uh, reversal in our um, in our polarity for the for the coils, which means I'm going to have to have a reversal in the current direction, and we're going to get into that in the operation. So steppers and brushless, they look kind of similar in terms of construction, but they are different. Um, your brushless is, if it's going to be a position actuator, is going to be a servo motor, which means that you're still going to have to have a sensor for feedback control. Stepper motors, they look similar in terms of construction, uh, but they are an open loop uh, feed forward position actuator. The brushless, because it has feedback, is going to be able to account for uh, an unexpected loads, like a um, disturbance of some sort. So if you grab onto the, the shaft as it's spinning, you're going to apply a, a frictional load. Well, the brushless can deal with that because it's got feedback. So it's going to say, OK, I didn't quite get to the position, position I was expecting, so I'm going to change my, um, my control effort. A stepper is not going to know that. A stepper has absolutely no feedback, and so if you cause it to miss steps because you have um, added additional load, there's no fixing it. It is open loop only. Brushless are much faster, uh, and you don't see the same sort of overheating. Steppers, though, because you don't have a feedback device, mean that that's one less thing that can fail. Um, your stepper is also pretty cheap, and you are going to be less sensitive to your, your load fluctuations. <clears throat> so in terms of shaft power, resolution, digital control, you can see those. The digital control is interesting uh, because the stepper motor and driver are are expecting a digital pulse, then you don't need anything extra. You just send a pulse. So it works really well with a, a micro um, microcontroller providing an input to a stepper motor. If you're going to use a servo, you're going to need some sort of uh, controller that's going to convert your digital signal into an analog voltage. And so that's, again, more components and more cost. If you're going to if all you care about is position and you know very well what you're dealing with and you don't need the the sensor then a stepper is a good option when you're dealing with a microcontroller um, yeah the the steppers they are very consistent in terms of sizing uh, so because the the flange dimensions are all standardized it's not a big deal to swap one out with another. No, no big deal whatsoever. Um, there's also a f number of drivers that can be used with these, which is great. Um, they are noisy. They do uh, use a lot of current because it, when you think about a servo motor, um, you are putting current in because you need torque. And so when you reach your, your position, then you don't need any more torque because you, you've gotten it already. But your stepper motor is always driving those electromagnets, um, and so the electromagnets are always consuming energy just to, just to hold position. So you will use more power. 
So there we go. We have talked through this, the designs. I'm going to stop the video here and I'll pick it up with operation.